Welcome, I'm Dr. Robert Gladder, Medical Advisor for Medscape Emergency Medicine. Today we have Dr. Peter Papadakis, Professor of Anesthesiology and Director of Critical Care Medicine at University of Rochester Medical Center to discuss the ongoing staffing shortages affecting hospitals throughout the United States. Welcome, Dr. Papadakis. Welcome, thank you very much for inviting me. It's my pleasure, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I wanted to talk about an interesting piece that you wrote in Anesthesia News title of it is in the care of strangers the post pandemic staffing crisis and it really rang home to me because it, because it, you know you visit a lot of important points about the influx of locums providers especially during covid and how it affected morale but also team building and really cohesiveness among hospital staff and it was very eye opening and when i'll start off with basically why are we in the midst of a national post covid-19 staffing crisis what are the root causes of this you know, I, I, I think as I point out in the article, it, it's, uh, it's a multiplicity of reasons. One is burnout. Many people worked incredibly long hours during COVID, physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, all kinds of technicians. Then you had another component uh, that, that added into this, which was the mandates for vaccinations that some staff said, I just don't want to deal with this. Then we had people who left the profession because professions, because of the pandemic, people with concomitant medical conditions that were afraid that suddenly working in a hospital was gonna endanger their health, a spouse's health or whatever. So we had a large drain of staffing uh, at that point in time during the post pandemic period. There's some pushback of young people entering healthcare fields because they saw that healthcare workers were on the front lines, endangering themselves initially, whereas a, a, a spouse or a sibling who had an office job was working from home. And you know that, you know, as the demographic of people that enter healthcare changes, you know, level of dedication is not what it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. So the question I have to you is how does this affect patient care directly? When you have lots of locums providers, temporary staffing agencies filling hospitals with people that are unfamiliar, say, with certain protocols and that take time to get up to speed. Are there adverse effects on patient outcomes? We have a multidisciplinary team made up of the physicians, the mid-level providers, the nurses, the therapists, and we've all practiced together. So we work together on a daily basis as a team, and that takes time to develop relationships. Suddenly with the influx of locums tenants uh, and temporary people, you have people on three week contracts, six week contracts, they don't get oriented. They don't know who you are. You don't know what their capabilities are, what problems they might have, what skill sets are owned for them, what skill sets are deficient in them. So it completely decays that sort of trust of the team that we use every day in, in the care of very, very sick patients in various environs of the hospital. But it's not only critical care areas and EDs and operating rooms that are affected by this team. We also have teams and, and groups that work on the floors taking care of less ill patients. You know, an anecdotal story, one of my colleagues told me they were running a code uh, as an emergency medicine physician uh, in a hospital in uh, the Midwest, and suddenly the nurse goes, doctor, I'm not gonna do that. We don't do that in California. That's not our first line drug in California. That's not an appropriate conversation to be having during an acute event, right? I, absolutely, I agree. And, and so uniformity is an important you know, point that when you bring in a, a temporary locums provider, do they go through um, training or simulation? Is there any protocol um, or protocols that hospitals have in place when they bring in, you know, people that are credentialed, but maybe not familiar with the local flavor of how things run. Uh, initially, for nurses and a lot of our house staff and everything else, we're talking week-long orientations over extended periods of time that were normally happening pr prior to the pandemic. When you have somebody on a five-week contract, you're not going to be able to do an orientation program for the person that's there for a five-week contract. You're using that person immediately because you're filling a hole in your schedule, right. a hole to keep your beds open. 
because as, as you know, many, many states require nurse to patient ratios. So if you don't have enough staff, you're going to be browning out beds, which, which is going to be a major problem. You know, it, it's not just hospitals. It's also nursing homes are going through this. They don't have enough certified nurse uh, assistants. They, they don't have enough nurses. So they're not able to take admissions. So then you get another backlog at the hospital. So, you know, this whole uh, shift from permanent employment at, at, at a hospital, nursing home, office, satellite clinic has massively impacted the fl patient flow. So what can we do to reduce the attrition and the migration, you know, to staffing agencies that, you know, that current employees are seeing new graduates? Um, what can we do? I mean, we're talking salary increases, bonuses, more paid time off, wellness. I mean, what's, what, is there a way to sort of attack this and to, to you know, reduce the attrition? Well, what I think we need to do as clinicians is start working with the people in our C-suites, you know, the leadership of the hospital, because we cannot survive, you know, and they cannot survive this as a long-term staffing issue. In healthcare, you need to have teams, you need to have people who are experienced working together on a regular basis. So we need to try to mitigate that attrition. One of the th problems that we have is when we bring in locums in any hospital, you bring in locums, their salary is many multiples over your current bedside staff, right. which makes the bedside staff develop a certain hatred. You know, so one of the things as clinicians that we can't control is how do we start elevating the salary of our allied health providers, nurses, respiratory therapists, technologists, x-ray techs, that they're less likely to go leave the, the institution. If you've talked to any locums or you talk to anybody else, what you make as a salary is a very important thing. We're very material people. Obviously, working conditions, you know, uh, scheduling, being more open for scheduling, one of the things I've been told by colleagues is the ability to provide daycare on site for, for, for uh, health providers that have young children, professional education benefits, you know, CME for physicians, nursing credits, ability, possibly helping in tuition for a nurse to get a more advanced degree, become a nurse practitioner or mm -hmm. a therapist to move up the academic ranks. These are all things that we can do. But again, what is the mechanism with limited funds that the hospitals have to be able to do those things? Right. I mean, the reality is that locum staffing is not going to go away. We both know that. Um, and, it does and, fill a need when someone has an, un, un, you know, an, accident, an accident, an injury, um, is sick, and, and, and we need someone immediately. So there is a role for it. But sustainability is the question here. And in terms of the solvency of hospitals is really at risk. And, and, but, and I think you point that out in your article. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. The solvency of the hospitals uh, have definitely decayed. The bottom line is decaying. Hospitals are bleeding money because they are paying many more multiples of salaries that they never expected based on fixed reimbursement. Medicare, Medicaid, your private insurance companies did not increase reimbursement because you are now staffing 50% of your, your staff is locum tenants, you know? And so the hospital will eventually become insolvent or hospitals before they become insolvent start cutting down services, be it freestanding emergency rooms, be it uh, obstetrics and gynecology, outpatient clinics, you know, hospitals throughout the country, as has been pointed out in the literature, are closing down services in a time where we need more services. Absolutely. And this is a problem. I mean, the rural areas especially are going to be the hardest hit with closures, but also urban areas. They're not immune. And so, you know, the federal government may have to play a role here to sort of rescue some of, of these institutions because of, of the, you know, the staffing crisis and the economics of it, basically. Uh, you know, I think you bring up an important point, but I have not seen any in interest 
in our legislators, be it at the state or the national level that are even aware that this is happening and the whole American health system is becoming insolvent. I would think, as I pointed out in my article, that this would be breaking news that the majority of hospitals are now staffed by non-traditional you know, means. They're all right. in financial distress. Services are being cut down. And I've not seen anything or heard much on the national media or the local media reporting on this. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the effects of climate change on the practice of medicine are, is, is another thing we can't ignore. We're also going to see seasonal uh, variation. You know, it's not just the heat wave, seasonal variation. A lot of nurses from northern states who don't like driving through snowstorms, right, are going to leave the area to go down and take contracts in the Sun Belt, right? And nurses that normally would come up from the Sun Belt to the northern environments are not exactly going to get, uh, you know, want to work in Buffalo in January. The other thing that's happening, which is kind of an interesting thing, when you talk to um, physicians uh, and other health providers in large cities, is what we have is uh, musical chairs locally. You have major university hospitals that have nurses from the other major university hospital down the street. It's just like rotating chairs. Nurses from hospital A are working in hospital B, B is working in E and D, and they keep rotating versus having a set staff. Right. They don't even have to leave their area. So big cities might have an advantage with you know, what I call locums locums. <laughs> you know, local exactly. locums people versus small rural acute care, acute need hospitals. They're not going to get staff that's in the area that's been working at a competing institution. They're going to close beds. They may have to close down and closing down a uh, rural uh, a, acute need hospital is catastrophic for the people in the area. And I think this should be, you know, front and center in the news cycle. I think that the public really needs to have an awareness of this and that this has to be brought to a legislative level, um, if not at the hospital level, but, you know, at the state level to really look at this critical staffing shortage that exists. The thing that's happening, uh, which is something which makes no sense to me. Yes, you can make more money traveling, but suddenly you also have no insurance. No 401k, you know, there are a lot of other benefits that people get. So you now have possibly a lot of healthcare professionals who are uninsured. That's because a good point. The, yeah. the temptation is you get lots of money, but you, you know, you're used to somebody else paying your premiums, you know, your, your employer. Right, your employer right. used to give you a 401k or educational benefits or whatever. You're not getting any of those things. So we're, we're creating people who have temporary financial gain, but may not have long-term stability. Right. The locums companies, though, will give you data saying that the, 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 the typical profile of a provider is someone who is 20 to 25 years in practice, you know, older into their 50s or 60s, and at the end of their career, um, and a very small percentage are younger, I believe 10%, according to one report. And so this age differential and experience gap um, is what they will show you in terms of their data. And the kind of providers that we're seeing are, are at least on my end, are younger, um, not so much the older provider. And so maybe you could explain a little bit of this disconnect. You're right. The model 10, 15 years ago was the retiree who would want to see the country get put up in a garden apartment in Arizona with a pool. Limited number of locums people. So the locums company telling me about something that existed five, 10 years ago is not the truth that you will have now. Because if you look around any hospital, you see the majority of your locums nurses, locums anesthesia providers are young people who are one to two years out of training. Some of them complete 
you know, we're talking about people in their 20s and 30s. We're not talking about the data that they're showing retirees and people at the end of their career. That is what they used to do. Correct. And it also, if you talk to the locums company, a locums company may have had 20 or 30 people on contract. The locums companies now have tens of thousands of people on contract. 20, 30 years ago, were you actively or I was not being actively being recruited to join a locums company? It was like something you heard about from an older physician, you know, kind of word of mouth. Uh, now it's out there. Everybody knows about it. I also think when you bring locums into a hospital, especially at the nursing, um, mid-level, advanced practitioner, respiratory therapy, x-ray tech, lab technologists, anesthesia techs, operating room scrub technologists, and the technologist who is working at your institution finds out about the uh, the cash rewards of joining the locums company, right? I think they would want to join the locums company. Yeah, I mean, the reality is lots of young doctors are in debt and they see the financial rewards of locums and ways to pay back their debt. So that might be a motivation that lures them in. And, and one of the other things is I think we need a new type of hospital management because none of them have ever dealt with this problem before. Every C-suite, every chair, every nursing director is in shock because this has never happened before. I've heard of CEOs of hospitals planning early retirement so they're not at the helm of, of, of a health system when it goes bankrupt. Absolutely, and I think the outcomes, you know, patient outcomes really will really be the important part of this crisis that we're facing. Are we gonna see increased, you know, numbers of patients with poor outcomes or longer lengths of stay, or, you know, it, it's gonna translate into adverse, um, adverse effects on the I think we course. already have some reports uh, that, uh, you know, uh, hospital acquired infections have gone up because people are not familiar with the guidelines and protocols of a specific institution that they're now working, right? right. The whole reporting system for quality a locums doesn't know how to report an issue in the quality assurance system of whatever institution they are. You know, it's ta it takes time and practice to develop that. So I think we're gonna see massive increases in outcome problems, a decay in a robust quality assurance sa patient safety system that's been developed over the last number of decades because there's no buy-in if you're there as a temporary. Right, and there's no federal reporting system in, in, the, in, the, in the era of locums, especially since COVID that I'm aware of that integrates these outcomes or patient safety issues um, with these providers that come into hospitals at moment's notice. Um, and I think that's an important thing that we need to really address. What is gonna happen to the medical legal system, the malpractice system? What is the coverage and responsibility of the locums company for providing a subpar individual that suddenly caused a, a, a bad outcome? Right. What is the legal responsibility of the employer, the hospital who suddenly has somebody in that they're not fully vented uh, in their own system that suddenly right, does right. something, uh, there's a bad outcome. So it, it's a multi-level problem that needs to be addressed. Yeah. Well, obviously these are important issues that we, we've discussed and, and hopefully these can be addressed. I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you again for your time, uh, your expertise.